um, happy first uh, Sunday of Advent to you. Um, friends, also good morning to our new people. If you are here for the first time or you see our uh, broadcast uh, service for the first time, uh, the Lord be with you as well. So, uh, and also thank you for all uh, faithful um, visitors and supporters of St. Andrews. Friends, I just want to uh, announce three upcoming events uh, for you, for your attentions first. Um, this Saturday, we're going to have uh, Left Place Christian Men and Women Choir here at 7.30. So come over and then enjoy uh, beautiful songs that he, um, Christmas songs that they are going to sing in the choir. And also next week, we will see bell ringers and our choir will collaborate together for a Christmas carol and lessons. And lastly, I want to uh, draw your attention to our first time blue Christmas service. That will be on uh, December 21st at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary. So blue Christmas service is a service that we want to, uh, it's a, a dedicated space for everyone who uh, lost their loved ones, maybe this year, maybe years ago. And you want to, we, we want to honor uh, our grief and we want to come together and then support one another with uh, your fellowship and service at the Blue Christmas uh, on the 21st of December, 7 p.m. That's all from me. So I would like to invite Fiona. Well, Reverend Daniel said, covered most of what I was going to say, <laughs> but that won't stop me from talking. Never give me a microphone. Um, first of all, we'd like to pass on our Christian sympathies to John and Brenda Weavers, the Degner and Weavers family, on the passing of John's brother, Jerry, this week. Please keep that whole family in your thoughts and prayers and anyone else you know of at this time in need of special thoughts. Many thanks to everybody who helped decorate our sanctuary. It is looking so beautiful as we head into the Christmas season with our first Sunday of Advent. And thank you to all of those who were involved. And also, when you join us for coffee and fellowship down in the gymnasium, you will notice it too has been decorated. So thank you to everybody who participated in that. If you're new with us today and are a visitor, coffee is served through that side door straight ahead and just listen for the noise. You'll know where we are. A little note, the Angel Tree campaign has actually been extended one more week. So you, can, you still have until next Sunday, the 10th, to bring a gift. As I came in the door, I noticed there were only three angels left. So that has been a wonderful uptaking of your support on that. But you have until next Sunday uh, to donate a gift for the angel tree. Many other things in the bulletin, Christmas letters on its way, they'll outline lots of things that are happening. If you would like to place a memorial poinsettia in the church, please get in touch with Debbie in the office to let her know so that your memorial can be put in the bulletin over the festive season. Uh, ECM, Ecumenical Campus Ministry, have their meal coming up. Their coffee fundraiser is ending. Make sure and speak to Karen Robbins and give her your money for your uh, orders of coffee. And as you heard, next Saturday, Lethbridge Christian Women's Choir are holding their Christmas concert and they will have two special guests. One is the Christian Men's Choir, the other is the Cairo Ringers, whom you'll all be familiar with. We played last week. In order to facilitate that, anyone with a strong back with us today, the communion table will need to be removed and put to the side of the sanctuary and the chairs in the choir loft need to be moved in order to make space for all the choirs and the handbells up at the front. So anybody who is able to assist, we would really appreciate it because I can't do it, I'm afraid, on my own. Um, another little note just to add, 
next Sunday's service, as you heard, is a service of lessons and carols. The traditional Christmas readings interspersed with all your favourite Christmas hymns and carols. In the bulletin it does say there will be a communion. That is a misprint. We're having communion today, as you can see. There will not also be a communion along with the service next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fiona. Friends, join me for the call to worship for today. The nights are long and the days are short. And so we wait for Jesus. The heavens are trembling with anticipation. And so we wait for Jesus. Our redemption is drawing near. And so we wait for Jesus. Let us put our hope in God as we prepare to welcome the birth of new life once more. Let us pray. Creator God, you made the heavens and the earth. You set the planets in their courses, lit the sun with fire, caused the star to shine and the world to turn. Life springs up wherever your breath moves. In Jesus Christ, you brought hope into a world full of fear and despair. You sent your spirit to enliven our hope and guide us on the way. Now we wait in anxious times for the world to be made new. Move in us and in all your creation to bring forth new life while we wait with hope in your grace and goodness. Amen. Our first hymn for today, hymn number 122, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. I invite you to stand if you are able. invite Bob and Deb to light our first candle of Advent, candle of hope.
The prophets call and the psalmist sings to announce that hope comes from God. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence. We shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. The world cries for justice and transformation. Advent summons us to watch, to wait, and to hope. In the destruction of the current order is the promise of a new order beyond our imagination. Signs of hope are all around us if we have the patience to wait and to see them. Holy are you, source of all new life among us. Jesus Christ comes as the hope of the world. We join with all creation and lift our hearts in joyful praise. We light this candle to bear witness to hope. Bob and thank you Deb for reading our um, first reading for Candle of Hope today. Friends, our next hymn, hymn number 109, All Earth is Waiting to See the Promised One. Verses 1, 2, 3, and invite you to stand if you are able. Friends, join me for the prayer of confession. In unison, let us pray. Redeeming God, we confess that waiting is difficult. When the world around us is on edge, we are impatient with each other, waiting for someone to make a difference. We are impatient with you, O God, waiting for a sign that things will improve. Forgive us, O God, Turn our hearts to you again and again, and show us how to act in hope for Jesus' sake. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. There is nothing we have done, nothing we'll ever do, that can separate us from the love of God made known in Jesus Christ. 
So take hope in this love and live as forgiven and forgiving people. And may the peace and the hope of Christ reign in your heart. How about we pass the peace and hope of Christ to one another as well? Peace of Christ and hope of Christ be with you. Marcel, of Christ, peace of Christ be with you. Jenny, peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. Thank you, everyone. Peace of Christ be with you all. Today, um, I would like to invite Isabel uh, for the presentation of Catherine Webster Bursary. Good morning. The Catherine M. Webster Memorial Music Bursary was established in 1995. To understand the significance of this bursary, it's important to know a little of the background of Catherine McPherson Webster. Shortly after Catherine's birth in Regina, in June 1912, her parents moved to Lethbridge where she attended Sunday school at Knox Presbyterian Church, which preceded St. Andrews in terms of the history of Presbyterians in Lethbridge. It was while Catherine was at Knox that she joined the choir at age 16 thus beginning her involvement in music that lasted for 40 years until her retirement in 1968. It was in the 1950s that Catherine formed a junior choir, which she continued to lead into the late 1960s. After learning the art of handbell ringing at the Banff School of Fine Arts, as well as in Calgary, she formed and directed the first handbell choir at St. Andrews. With Catherine's great love of music, both religious and classical, she encouraged young people to achieve their best in the music programs within the church and outside the church. Catherine remained a dedicated member in the life and work of St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church Lethbridge for over 60 years, until her passing in 1994. This brings us to, to today. She's left a bursary in her name that is to be awarded on the first Sunday of Advent to some dedicated young people that participate in the music life of St. Andrews. On behalf of the Spiritual Life team, I am pleased to present the 2023 Catherine M. Webster Memorial Music Bursary to two very deserving individuals who have been a vital part of our choir. I'd like to call up Eva Parker and Marcel Veenstra to come stand in front of the community. We have appreciated Eva's participation in our services as a member of the choir. She has an amazing singing voice and has shown growth in her confidence as a member of St. Andrew's Choir. She's even included in her application that she's committed to the musical life of St. Andrew's. Eva is currently in grade 11 and she also studies voice with an instructor at the Conservatory of Music at the University of Lethbridge. Congratulations, Eva. Our second music bursary, yes, we can hear you. Our second music bursary recipient is Marcel Wienstra. Marcel has been a very welcome addition to the choir this past year and has also performed on piano. He, uh, he studies piano under our very own Corey Hausauer, as well as another instructor, and is currently studying for his Royal Conservatory Music uh, Grade 10 exams. Marcel is also currently registered for the University of Lethbridge in Canto Singers Choir and also plays, uh, enjoys playing saxophone in a band for the local It's About Music Society. We are so blessed to have these musical talents and particip participation of these two musicians here at St. Andrews. Please join me in applauding the 2023 Music Bursary recipients. <laughs>
Now uh, we're going to hear the uh, choir singing today. Enjoy and be blessed. and choir. That's so lovely. Candlelight carol. I would like to invite Fiona to uh, come again to read Psalm 25 for uh, our scripture reading today. Friends, as Fiona comes forward, I want you to, to hear Psalm 25 or if you open your Bible and see Psalm 25 as a book of diary. This is a personal diary of King David. And I want you to feel not only to to so try to use your feeling as well. Feel the, uh, the, the complexities of his problems in, in, in his diary. But how he chose 
to cling to God for hope. Hear the word of the Lord. To you, O God, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who are they that fear the Lord? He will teach them the way that they should choose. They will abide in prosperity, and their children shall possess the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever towards the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me, be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. O oh, guard my life and deliver me. Do not let me be put to shame for I take refuge in you. My integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O Lord, God, out of all its troubles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Fiona. Friends, let us pray. God of grace, you speak words of hope in the midst of anxious times. Send your Holy Spirit to open our ears to that hope and give us wisdom to read our own times through the lens of your grace and then find comfort and courage through Christ, your living word. Amen. Friends, today we light the first candle of Advent, and it is the candle of hope. Why do humans need hope? Hope gives us confidence in life. And this confidence is the basis, foundational basis, for more practical dispositions such as patience, endurance, determination, courage, hope is the foundational basis. Hope provides aims and also the motivation to attain those aims. But things can happen in life where you suddenly find yourself at the downside of hope, helplessness and, ho and, and hopelessness. It could be the loss of someone dear to you. And this Advent and this Christmas so hard for you to come. Despite all the joyous and the celebrative things that you see out there a circumstance of life that is far too much to bear 
or significant things in life like health, family, career, that are not working out well this year. Or maybe a point in your life where you have got stuck and cannot see any path moving forward. A feeling that you are all by yourself or simply just a total loss of interest in life. In short, without hope, humanity will drown in utter despair. A number of years ago, researchers experimented to see how hope affects those underlying hardships. So two sets of laboratory rats were placed in separate buckets of water. I shared this last year, and I want to share it again to rekindle your memory. So the researchers left one set, one set of rats in the water, and then they found within just one hour, they had all drowned. The other set of rats, however, were periodically lifted out of the water just for a few seconds and then they put them back in the water. When that happened, the second set of rats swam for over 24 hours non-stop. The researchers confused why. They assumed because they were given a rest. But not, not because they were given a rest, but because they suddenly had hope. Those rats somehow hoped that if they could stay afloat just a little longer, someone would reach down and rescue them. I know it's a cruel experiment that demonstrates the role of hope. But what's the point here? If hope holds such power, for unthinking rodents, how much greater should the power of hope be in our lives? Now, I don't exactly know your life circumstances right now, but if you are here today with such a burden and you are trying your best to stay afloat in life, I want you to know that God's hands are not too short to take you out of the sea of despair that you perhaps are in right now. And by the way, your God is not a cruel researcher who does experiments on your life. He suffers with you in your suffering. He weeps with you in your weepings. Hebrews 4, 15 declares, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way. And I like this part. Just as we are. Your high priest is not different than you, just as we are. He had been tempted as well. He had lost hope as well. Yet he did not sin, the Bible said. So hope, my friends, in biblical terms, is an anchor for our souls. Without hope, our souls are tossed around by every wind of trial. Fear, loneliness, guilt are three common causes of hopelessness that lead to confusion in life. Let me say it again. Fear, loneliness, guilt are three common causes of hopelessness that lead to confusion in life. Our souls are restless without hope. But we who believe hope is an anchor for our souls and we are not without hope in this life. Our reading for today, Psalm 25, lets us see a journal or a diary of a restless king, King David. He was so restless to the point where he had no one to turn to, to calm his stormy soul. And so he cried out to God. David wrote verses 19 to 22. Consider how many are my foes, and with what violent hatred they hate me. Oh, guard my life and deliver me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem, O oh Israel, O oh God, out of all its trouble. Friend, this is one of many benefits of writing down your prayers in the diary or in the journal, just like David did. 
One day you could look back and then trace God's faithfulness and God's faithfulness was there for you and when you were low and as you face your present challenges, you can trust the same God who has shown his faithfulness to you in the past will show it again to you today. Now go back to David's uh, Psalms of David. David was clearly struggling and restless with fear. Remember, fear, loneliness, and guilt. Three common causes of hopelessness. David clearly struggling and restless with fear because his life, his reputation, and his country Israel, the country under his kingship, was in great danger. There were real threats here. Real foes who headed him to the point that they wanted to kill him. The symbol of a nation. You kill the king, you drop the moral of the nation. So he surely didn't compose this psalm with a feeling tight on his chest, I assume. And then perhaps sweaty hands and a pounding heart due to acute fear. But was fear the only one, the only storm that made him restless? No. David was struggling with loneliness. In verse 16, David wrote, Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Perhaps all his friends now at that time were running away from him. And it's interesting to know that even a king can feel lonely. David was not only a king. He was known as a man after God's own heart. So he had a close relationship with God. So even a man after God's own heart feels lonely sometimes. And the more you read this psalm, the more you will see that not only fear and loneliness that strike David at this point of his life, he was also overwhelmed in such a way with guilt. At least four times, David mentioned his struggle with guilt because of his sin. Verse 7, remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. Verse 8, good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. Verse 11, for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Verse 18, consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sin. David recalled not only the sins and stupid things that he did in his younger age, but he also admitted his present guilt was so heavy on him. So in the middle of all his external turmoil with foes threatening and friends forsaking him, the trouble of his life was compounded by the internal misery of a sinful and guilty heart. We talked about that last Sunday. Christ loves to win guilty souls back to him. Notice verse 17 again. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Did you hear that? The troubles of my heart are enlarged. In other words, it is the inward turmoil as much as the outer circumstances that make David so distressed. Fear, loneliness, and guilt. These three phantoms are more than enough to make any child of God confused about themselves, confused about life. What is it, God? What do you want from me? What am I supposed to do? Self and life do not make any sense anymore when you are in fear, in loneliness, and in guilt. These three are phantoms. We feel so uncertain about ourselves. Therefore, we feel uncertain about life. We just want to lie down and cry. We are utterly confused. No path seems to like a way out. Now humbled by life situation, David came to God, earnestly asking, 
So make me to know your ways. I have made you know my ways and it didn't work. So make me know your ways because my works didn't my way didn't work. Oh Lord, teach me your path. My path didn't work. Lead me in your truth. What I know about truth didn't work. And teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Verses 4 to 5. Fear, loneliness, and guilt are beneficial tools for a humble and teachable individual. Let me say it again. Fear, loneliness, and guilt are beneficial tools for a humble and teachable individual. They make the me in me realize that it is not God that needs to change. It is me that needs to change. Make me to know your ways. I'm stubborn with my own ways. Fear, loneliness, guilt for a humble sinner and teachable sinner are beneficial. It is me that needs his ways. It is me that needs, who needs your pets. Isn't this sound precious? It helps us to see ourselves clearly through David's diary. Every one of us struggles at one time or another with fear, with loneliness, with guilt and confusion about life. Now, what we do? David, if you ask David, what should we do now? I'm in fear, I'm in loneliness, I'm in guilt and confused about life. David's answer was, pray. Let it all out to God. Write it down if you have to. This is exactly what we need to do when we are threatened, when we are lonely, when we feel huge guilt and uncertain about life. Run to God. Not from God. Run to God. Your God can handle your big emotions. Your spouse maybe cannot. Your good friends maybe they cannot handle. But your God has a heart as wide as ocean. He can handle your big emotions. There is an old gospel song. He will carry you the title. And then the lyrics goes like this. There is no problem too big. God cannot solve it. There is no storm too dark. God cannot calm it. There is no mountain too tall. God cannot move it. There is no sorrow too deep. God cannot soothe it. If he carries the ways of the world upon his shoulders, I know that he will carry yours too. If God could carry the weight of the world's problems upon his shoulders, I know the song says he will carry us and our burdens too. When you come to God in prayer, it's personal. And God gives us and God guide us by bringing our hearts in such a way and minds into harmony or sympathy with his own heart and mind. In prayer, God teaches us his way. He makes us to know his way by alerting us to significant facts of the situation within our hearts or by awakening us, give conviction in our hearts to the implication of his own character and his purpose. Prayer is not so much, by the way, talking to God. It's also about listening to God. Again, David asks, make me to know your ways. So you need to listen in prayer too. When David asks himself, how can I be sure that God will lead me on? That God will 
talk to me and listen, make me to know his ways. He describes the kind of person who can be confident of God's help and guidance. And that's in verses 8 and 9. There are two characteristics mentioned in these two characters. If you have these two characteristics, you can have confidence. God's help and guidance will be for you as well. First one, the sinners. The first characteristic, God's guidance and help will be for them. First, the sinners. The kind of person who can be confident of God's help and direction is a sinner. First eight says, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. Don't get David wrong. David is not saying that sin is a qualification to hope for God's guidance. Nope. What David is saying is that sin is not a necessary obstacle to guidance. God's guidance is always available even for sinners. For God is good and upright. We saw David confess his sinfulness four times in this psalm. Sinlessness is not a guarantee of God's guidance. It is God's goodness to sinners that guarantee his guidance and instructions. Again, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners. Second characteristic. The humble. First 9 says, He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble His way. A humble person who admits his or her sinfulness and feels helpless in himself or herself has one of the spiritual qualifications for knowing and have confidence in expecting God's help and guidance in his or her life. My friends, God loves humble sinners, but he opposes prideful sinners. I do not know the condition of your heart. When you enter the church building, when you step out of your car, but if you come today, as a humble sinner, with restless heart, contrite, regretful, guilty, lonely, confused, chastened, ashamed kind of heart. I want you to know that I'm glad you are here. But most importantly, your good God is glad to see you here. You are brave and you honest with your heart's condition, with yourself and with your God. And God longs to instruct you and me in His way. He desires to lead us in what is right and teaches us His way. And this is the anchor that you need for your soul. Friend, it's hard to come to God if we think God is not good. Or if we think God is mad at us because of our sins. Oh, that's hard. Your God is not bad, nor is He mad with you. Your God is so good and upright, and He is more than ready to instruct and lead you in what is right. And that's the anchor for the soul. To continue to hope. Who are here are not sinners. Who are here are not humbled by love situation. We have two characteristics that make us confident to come to God and have hope in Him. God loves humble sinners, but He opposes prideful sinners. Amen.
Friend, today, on the first Advent, we're going to have celebrate Sacrament of Communion together. I want you to come to this table. You who have much faith, and you who would like to have more. You who have been to this sacrament often, and you who have not been for a long time. You who have tried to follow Jesus, and you have failed. Come, it is Christ who invites us to meet Him right here. Friends, again, I just, this is just a kind reminder to stay and remain seated where you are. Our elder servers will distribute the elements to you, and we will take the elements together. I would like to invite elders to come forward.
One night, when Jesus was with, his, was with his disciples, while they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and then said, Take it, this is my body. I invite you to stand, let's take eat the bread together. Then Jesus took a cup. After giving thanks, he gave it to them and saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us take the wine together. As often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. As Jesus gave thanks to God for the gifts of the earth, so let us give thanks for what we receive from God's hand today. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we are so grateful for the gifts you just shared with us from this table. For we know what they cost you. So send us out in the strength of the Holy Spirit, unafraid of what surface in your name will cause us. For we will be faithful to you, now and always. Amen. You may be seated. The first Sunday in Advent celebrates God, God's gift of hope. It is not easy to be hopeful when you are fear, lonely, and guilt. In stressful times but God's steadfast presence give us the courage to hope so we offer in our offering today whatever we have to share knowing our gifts can spread hope in the world God loves by touching lives in Jesus name let's prepare our offering and let us sing our hymn for the offering hymn number 349 my hope is built on nothing else
join me for the offering prayer. God of hope, we offer you our gifts, knowing that you can do with them more than we can ask or even imagine. Bless what we offer as tangible signs of your love at work in the world on edge and as symbols of the hope we share in Jesus Christ, our Lord and friend. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessing flow. Doxology. My friends, go in hope today and stay awake. Watch for the signs of God at work around you and also within you. Look for opportunities to serve others in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <laughs>